All right, hello, wine drinking people. We are back with one of more of what I drank yesterday, and this tasting happened a week ago from tonight when we we're reviewing it. And man, it's been just crazy busy here in the store. A lot of great drinking going on, but we promise to get all of this stuff out to you as it happens as quickly as we can, folks. And uh, what a fantastic night with Bo Barrett at Cafe Max a living legend in the California wine industry. We learned a few things from him, like integrity is everything. And I agree with that concept. You know, we're only here for a short time. The most important thing and the longest lasting thing that we can give on to the next generation is that integrity. So one of the things that Chateau Montalena has always had, another thing I learned that, uh, well, the reductive style of winemaking, where the wine does not see any oxygen at all, uh, leads to a thing called pinking, which uh, a when a tiny amount of oxygen is injected into the bottle at the time of bottling, uh, this pink color comes out in, you know, two to six weeks while well, it goes away. They didn't know that. And uh, because of that, they almost sold off this 1973 Chardonnay from Chateau Montalena in bulk. And, uh, well, luckily, two to six weeks later, it did turn around and then it came across the pond over to Paris and the tasting of 1976. The shot heard around the world in the wine industry and uh, the rest is history. You know, the influx of foreign investment, really, it was incredible what happened in Napa Valley after this Paris tasting. And, uh, you know, there's a few other things that happened in the movie that, uh, you know, well, hey, you know, you have to make up things for Hollywood to make it a little more interesting. They figured, let's send Bo off to the Paris tasting instead of Jim. And, uh, you know, there's those things you just look at and go, really? Jim's going to send his son to go to Paris to this tasting? Heck no. And, of course, he did not. Bo was seeing a home in Napa Valley. And Jim was having dinner at Chateau Las Combes when he heard that uh, his Chardonnay had bested all of these great properties um, in Burgundy. And uh, what an exciting time it must have been for them. And it was an exciting time for us to sit and have dinner and chat with Bo about these things. And, you know, we taste as we tasted through these nine vintages of wines that were brought by you, our collectors, uh, Bo told us about these different periods in his winemaking history. And uh, the first three wines, the 84, the 86, and 87, were what he called, you know, the first kind of period where, uh, you know, these guys still included the stems, which uh, they give you this harsh kind of tannin, which after he pointed this out, you really notice them in the 1986 vintage. Uh, and then the second period of winemaking, which included the 1997 vintage wine, which was my favorite wine of the night. Didn't have the stems in these the wines. And, you know, both of these still had this, uh, you know, uh, uh, this characteristic about them that spoke volumes about the place where they were made because the natural fauna in the winery in the old world is part of the wine. You know, it's one of these things that lends to the complexities and the nuance in the wine. And even though it didn't have these stem tannins, you still notice some of that funk that you had, you know, from Chateau Montalena and this uh, thing called Britannomyces, which Jim Law pointed out with a 2001 vintage that it was, uh, you know, infected it to the point where he was so sensitive to Britannomyces he couldn't drink the wine rated at 69 points. Well, we did have the 2001 on this evening and it showed excellently just like it has every time I've had the wine any Robert Parker rated it 96 points so uh, one of the most controversial wines in the wine industry because of that and uh, you know the 2001 2005 and 2007 kind of the third period uh, of winemaking where they changed the barrel regime and really upgraded you know how they did a lot of other things at the winery so you really notice these distinctive differences uh, with the different periods of wine the 2007 five and one like I said you notice that new barrel regime these wines were still very young and uh, you know you really noticed uh, the quality of the oak and the fruit pronounced in these wines they had lovely nuance to them red plum and uh, the 2007 probably being my favorite of the three although uh, the 2000 and uh, Five and 2001, outstanding as well. The 2001, I'm sorry, was my favorite of the three. Looking through my notes here, my ratings again. And, uh, you know, this wine had a little bit of under uh, underbrush and a little bit of an earthy quality to it, but still had a lot of everything else. Cigar box spice, uh, black licorice, uh, currants, and really nice and densely packed on the palate with hints of eucalyptus and that cigar box spice showing through the finish. The 2000, you really noticed the wood in this wine. It was a light vintage. You had this lovely caramel toffee kind of note to the nose and really soft fruit, but drinking at or near its peak right now. The 97 was the wine of the night for me. You know, from the time I opened this wine up, you know, it had this kind of dilly kind of character to it. Cigar wrapper, really beefy and fresh black earth. Uh, just the most nuances of all the nose and this bright fruit still shining through this black currant and cassisberry fruit. Lovely, uh, smooth and polished on the tongue with uh, just layers of this uh, fruit spice and uh, the earth showing through this wine and lots of fruit left and the silky smooth texture of this wine 
killer juice. Still has a ways to go in the bottle. The 92 had kind of a, a fairly earthy wine on the nose when you first opened it up. You really noticed that cigar box spice and fresh earth and gravelly, minerally nuance. And uh, still nice and lively on the palate. And, uh, um, you know, a host of that cigar box spice and earth showing on the finish, but really lovely balance in this wine, too. 87, uh, this wine was the lightest of the older bunch, I think. Well, the 87 and the 84, the 84 was the oldest. It should have been the lightest, but uh, still showing nice freshness. And even some fruit showing through in this wine. Excellent, still wonderful balance, this 87 and 86. My favorite of the old dogs had this lovely cigar box spice to it and uh, some serve wok kind of earthy character fruit showing and some black licorice spice there as well smooth and polished on the tongue and like I said you notice that uh, stem tan on after Bo pointed it out really 84 had this sweet toffee like uh, uh, of nuance to the nose still and uh, fine herbs and a really nice balance to this wine on the palate smooth as silk and showing nice uh, freshness still the second part of the dinner Ali knocked it out of the park as he always does is after I made Bo really work hard this evening and he got up afterwards and after he had told people about these nine vintages in the front of the room a little bit loud sorry about that Bo and then moved to the back room we could relax and have dinner and uh, you know had some fantastic uh, food back there as you can always count on Ollie for putting um, well not only fantastic food on the plate but enough of it the grilled grouper with a sweet and sour pineapple worked really nice with the uh, Chateau Montalina Chardonnay a style of Chardonnay that always a little more on the bright and crisp side, non-malolactic, so they age very well. I'm sorry, I completely skipped over the Riesling, uh, one of my favorite Rieslings coming from Potter Valley. This wine has this lovely aroma of uh, peach and orange blossom and honeysuckle, uh, apricot, melon, a really nice complexity, a little nutmeg and spice in there as well. Worked really nice with the uh, conch schnitzel with the orange and chili sauce. The sea scallop and melon also, and uh, the grilled shrimp, and then... Uh, the Zinfandel. Hey, you guys know that I don't like Zinfandel, but man, it actually worked pretty good with that duck confit, blackberry glaze, polenta croutons, and foie gras. Well, I love foie gras. That made the Zinfandel taste better. One of the things I love about food and wine pairings, huh? I mean, the food makes the wine taste better? Yes, absolutely, folks. Not a real uh, sweet style of Zinfandel, though. More on the savory side, and uh, you really notice that, I think, with this food pairing as well. It really brought it out. But a really well-balanced Zinfandel. The filet mignon with the mole sauce, wow, outstanding. And great with the Napa Cabernet. Uh, really nice red currant and cherry fruit showing on that. And uh, wonderful, uh, uh, some tannins in there too. Uh, worked really nice with the spice and the mole sauce. And then the grilled lamb chop with the wild mushrooms. And uh, sweet bacon and corn risotto. Man, anything you put bacon in it. Fantastic, and that rich dish needed a rich wine. The Estate Cabernet 2007. Wow, a blockbuster. Still needs a lot of time, but uh, much better with that food. And uh, that's what we had to eat at the Montalena Tasting at Cafe Max a week ago from tonight. I'm your host, Andrew Lampassoni, signing off for the Wine Watch, saying remember, always drink the good stuff first.